Hello and welcome to another episode in our lessons on Rust. So let's jump into it. Today we're talking about flow control. Now, today is actually a two-part series because we really have two parts of flow control. Today is going to be the general flow control, and then uh, you know the next lesson in this class is going to be on error handling, which is a type of flow control, uh, but we're not going to combine everything at once. And then we'll really, really briefly touch on loops, but we're not going to touch on iterators or how to do loops uh, with, with extra memory management considerations. Once we start to better understand lifetimes in Rust and things like that, then, then we'll come back and cover loops and iterators just a little bit more. But until then, we're just going to cover the easy cases. So let's get started and write some Rust. Today, we're just going to write some really easy statements. We're going to start with the easiest one, if statements. Let's do it. All right, we have an i32. We set it to 5. Let's check if it's greater than 5. Now, usually this would be like input from the user, but we're going to cover input from the user and error handling in the next lesson. That, that's, that's an if statement. There's no parentheses. It is just very clean, very straight and to the point. Now, we've checked if, if 10 is, or if i is less than 10, but let's check if i is exactly equal to 11, and we're done. That's how easy it is in Rust to check another variable. So this will is a else if, and we're checking if i is equal to 11. Remember, in Rust, double equal is comparison, single equal is assignment. So you can kind of watch this. Let's, let's do another one. This is how you say does not equal. So we're saying if i does not equal 100. Pretty simple. So you can throw the exclamation point on there, and that is the, the, the negating, the not equal. And then we can catch all of this if it's not one of these things, which means it would have to be 100. You can just put else, and, and, and that's it. So we can print a line here. We know because of this one that it, it has to be 100. Let's go ahead and run this and see what it returns. We would expect that it would print line is less than less than 10. So let's do it. i is less than 10. Let, let's change it. Let's make it 100. i is 100. We got we got this one because that we, we knew this was the one that would fall through all the cases. So you can play around with this and check, but let's move on. If is not really that useful. Honestly, I don't find myself using if, not if let. I find myself using if let or if else quite a bit. But if in its raw form, I don't find it that uh, useful because Rust has something pretty powerful um, that we can do. Now, some of you might be asking, what about tertiary? Uh, some languages have these weird mechanics where you can have tertiary. Um, and in a lot of languages, that's something like uh, x equals, you know, uh, thing or uh, other thing. And basically, like, if this is null, then it's this one or vice versa and, and things like that. Rust doesn't have that, but if you watched my previous lessons, you'll know that everything is assignable. So we can do this, and this is a tertiary statement just like you would expect. Let b equals if i is greater than 10. We're gonna make this uh, one. And you know, we could we could return this, but else we'll make it five. So this is a tertiary statement, but it's actually really easy to read. Uh, and, and like I said, we could actually break these out if we wanted to, like, like this, if that makes it easier for you to read. So we see that B is getting assigned to whatever is the outcome of this if statement. Pretty, pretty powerful. We can print this out. Now I'm gonna, I, I like putting this all on one line. I don't use this very often, and we're gonna get to something a little bit more powerful than this, and a reason I don't use if, just raw if statements very often. And we can run it and see what B. We would expect, since we're saying i is 100, we would expect if i is greater than 10, B is gonna be one. Yep, B is one. Perfect, perfect. All right, what's next? Why do I not feel compelled to use if statements a lot? And that's because of the match statement. Let's let's use it. Now, I have said that match is kind of like a switch case 
uh, a switch case statement in other languages. But it's really, really rudimentarily like. It's so much more powerful and so much more amazing. It can be used on enums, it can be used on anything. So we're gonna use it on an integer here. Now you're gonna see it's erroring right now. Why? Missing arm in type I32. So this is kind of like no fall through in switch case statements that's wanting all arms to be satisfied. Let's start matching on stuff. Well, since this is an integer, we'll probably need to match on integers. So on one, we're going to uh, just, uh, this is the syntax for it. There's a little equal and an arrow sign. And then you can do whatever it is that you would like to do. If it's one, we're just going to print that it I, I is one. And we can go on with this, but if you're looking at this and you're like, oh, can I only do something on a single line with a comma? And the fact is, no, you don't have to. This is the scope here, and we can define whatever scope we want by using curly braces. So let's do that now. And now we have just defined scope, and we can use it however we like. So here I have a double line in this match statement. Pretty easy, pretty simple. You'll notice it's still complaining, and that's because it wants every single one. Well, obviously there's a lot of ints in an I32, and we're not gonna write this whole list out in I32s, so we're going to create a catch-all. Now, you should do catch-alls very carefully, but a catch-all is just an underscore, and uh, that's it. And we're just gonna say it wasn't either a one or a two. Uh, I forgot a comma up here. Uh, this, this does need a comma to let us know that this is the next uh, match case there. And this is it. So if we run this, we should expect it not to be a one or a two. Let's run it. Was well, not a one or a two. Pretty cool. And now if we change this up to be a one, we should expect to see it change. We are manipulating the flow of code. I is one. As you can see, we have changed the flow of code. Match is so expressive. It's so easy to read and it and as you will see when we get to error handling, it really lends itself to handling a lot of things really well and really easily. Especially once you learn the power of enums, matching on enums is another level of awesomeness. So Rust really is a super expressive language and you know how, you know how I said everything's assignable? That's true of this as well. So how we did this if statement as a tertiary, this is, you know, quadruciary. I don't, I don't know how to say it, but you, you get the point. We can say let uh, C equals this match, and you know, each one of these could return, you know, a, a value, a, a number, or whatnot. Right now, it's doing this because it's not really returning anything, so we won't do that. But you could, if you wanted to, and watch my other video if you want to see more on that. We'll do more in the future. But let's move on. Let's move on. All right. As far as your classic loops, like I said, we're gonna cover more in detail. This is your standard flow control up here, but let's touch up base on just a little bit of looping. There's the first classic for loop. You can do for, i, in, uh, and then, you know, I'm just gonna give it a range here. This is how you create a range. And this is going to loop from one to 10, and i is going to be in that. And now you can also give it other things here instead of just this, but you know, like I said, we're gonna dive deeper into that in the future lesson. But for this, we can go ahead and see that this is looping each time by, we can go ahead and see that this is looping each time by just going ahead and printing it out. Now we're, we will expect to have several lines printed out probably nine. This looped nine times, like we expected. Pretty awesome. This is this is a pretty standard. Again, we, th this language does not have the extra um, open parentheses, so you don't need to be putting those in there. Um, in fact, Rust will complain, and there you have it. Now, that being said, there are two other ways to loop, which are very, very standard. You can do the while, and again, it can be while i is greater than zero, and obviously you should do i is equal to uh, um, uh, minus equal uh, one. We're getting an error. Why are we getting an error? First assignment to i, consider making this binding mutable. Oh, but it's not mutable so we can't change it. So let's go ahead and make this mutable. I always recommend that you start with an immutable 
and you find a reason to make it mutable. Not that you're searching for a reason, but you shouldn't make something mutable just because you want the option later on. It should be a conscious decision that you need that thing to be mutable. All right, so now let's run it. Now this obviously ran, but we didn't print anything, so we didn't really see anything. That was probably my bad. Let's uh, do this. All right, so let's just run this really quickly and see it run. There you can see it. we're counting down backwards from five because we made this mutable, and now, and now this is going through and decrementing it once. There's one other way that you can do. Um, you can just do, and this takes any Boolean uh, value. So you could say while something is not true, while something is true, you could also say while true, and then force break out of it if you like. Rust is going to warn you that this is upheld. A while expression is used for the predicate loop. The while, ex a better way to do this, a while true, would be this. They have an explicit call for that. Loop is effectively a while true. It's always going to loop. And then you can call break inside of this. And this is going to break out. Uh, so if you had some code, an if statement, a match statement that decided it was time to be done looping, you could call that then. So this is basically just a manual break. It's going to keep going until you tell it to calm down. This is how easy Rust is. All of this stuff is super standard, super easy to use. And remember, Rust is really expressive. It's really easy to use. And none of this is a big deal. I wanted to keep this short, so that's it. In the next lesson, we're going to dive into error handling. And it's really going to take this and use it in kind of a real world scenario. We're gonna take in user input and we're going to use that input and parse it. And we're gonna handle all the errors that can happen in doing that. So it's gonna be a lot of fun. It's gonna have some real actual code that does something, not just this. And uh, yeah, so I think you'll really enjoy it. So go ahead, stick around for that, and uh, let me know how I can make these things better for you.